प्रोफेसर इश्तियाक अहमद जिना हिज सक्सेस पेजेस एंड रोल इन हिस्ट्री दिस बुक हैज जनरेटेड अ लॉट ऑफ कॉन्ट्रोवर्सी एंड माई डिफिकल्टी इज दैट आई हैव अ लार्ज नंबर ऑफ स्टूडेंट एंड अ लार्ज नंबर ऑफ रीडर्स हु ऑन आई दर रीडिंग द बुक और सींग द प्रोग्राम फ्रॉम द बुक ऑन फेसबुक दे रिंग मी आप इवन अप टू द मिडल ऑफ नाइट आसिंग फॉर एक्सप्लेनेशन वॉट आई बीन राइटिंग माई बुक ऑन जिना my history a cultural history of pakistan my book on liaqat ali khan the first thing a person uh does about reviewing the book he sees on what sources is the book based This is a general historiographical approach to any subject in history. So here I found. Let me quote to you one by one. The source is what does he say, uh, Professor Isyak Ahmed? On page nine of this book says, "What I have learned from well-informed people in Pakistan that Pakistan British intelligence burnt and destroyed." a large corpus of secret documents that means we are dependent on those declassified documents the former paramount power has made public to know british policy on india this means that professor ishtiaq ahmed is negating the documents we have and most notably the transfer of power paper to our volumes is that size each has in 1200 page why he does that i'll come to later but uh, well informed people in pakistan is an unnamed and more important it's an unverifiable source the transfer of power papers are a verifiable source for the reason that they find corroboration first from leonard mosley's the last of days of the british raj which was published first in 1961 followed by pendrel moons edited table the viceroy's journal published by oxford in 1973 the crips version here it is the crips version based on the crips diary by peter clark who was master of trinity college in cambridge and these corroborate the transfer of power papers therefore i do not think that one should set aside the documentary sources and rely on unverifiable oral unnamed source that is what the next in line is who has he talks about culpability on the first page he says that but he jina in his has his detractors as well but he has his detractors as well who accuse him of being villain of the peace who bears most responsibility for the bloody partition of india page 1 this is on page 1 this is how he opens it now this is not uh, correct because uh, partition was preceded by at least a decade with riots riots did not cause partition to say that partition caused riots by which we is not historically accurate because riots preceded partition by at least one decade in 1937 when the congress formed 
governments in the provinces. The incidence of riots, extent of riots began to increase. That is one reason why the Muslim League was able to redo its losses in the 1937 election, winning more than 80% of the by-elections held. Now, culpability, I will give you two examples. First of all, let me put things in perspective. There are, there are riots, the riots which culminated in 1946, the great Cal Calcutta killing, the Navakhali killing, the Bihar killings, the Pahat killings, that was what? That was caused because the Congress went back on the cabinet mission plan. So that is also discussed ahead. Then, what is the personal attitude of the people concerned? Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru had said, I would rather see every village in India burned down rather than to retain the British army here even one day after August the 15th. This you find in Leonard Mosley's book. And I can give you the page number. Uh, that is page 149. It was uh, published by Widenfield and Nicholson from London in 1961 and Brace Harcourt and Word from New York in 1962. While, according to the transfer of power paper, Mrs. Jinnah said, I don't care whether you have to shoot Muslims or not. This has to be stopped. This means the riots have to be stopped. Let me make one distinction. The 1947 riots were not caused by the partition of India. They were caused by the partition of the province. Read Stanley Walpers, Gandhi's passion and you will find that Mahatma Gandhi had called partition of the provinces a needless irritation, a needless irritation. So, this was done by Mount Batten to meet the Congress demands. So, it is not Mr. Jinnah who can be called the villain of peace. The villain of the peace can be Mount Batten or Pandit Nehru who said that he would willingly have every village put to the top rather than have British group put down the riots. That goes for culpability. Now, cabinet mission plan. You see, why is this important in the history of the Pakistan movement? Cabinet mission plan, uh, Mr. Jinnah, the Cox Muslim League agreed to an arrangement where there would be grouping of provinces but no partition of the country. That is, the Muslim majority areas may have zonal autonomy, but they would not be sovereign. Mr. Jinnah had agreed to it and Professor Ishtiaq Ahmed actually says, asked Professor Farooq Dar that he must consider why Mr. Jinnah accepted the cabinet mission plan. So, it is such an important uh, turnstile in every uh, history of the freedom movement, every history of the Pakistan. Now, what does Professor Ishtiaq Ahmed say? The Congress leaders found the cabinet mission plan unacceptable and rejected it. Page 3. Now, this is a very sweeping and misleading statement. The Congress professed to have accepted the cabinet mission plan and it was on the basis of that profession that they wanted to push out the Muslim League from the interim government. 
Mahatma Gandhi had extracted from Lord Celtic Lawrence the Secretary of State for India the concession that the cabinet mission plan would not be in the nature of an award but of nature of a recommendation. This was unknown to the Viceroy Lord Weber, it was unknown to Maulana Abul Kalam Azad, the President of the Congress and it was unknown to Muhammad Ali Jinnah, President of the Muslim League. The all three of them died without knowing what, what had happened. And we learn of this because uh, Lord Patrick Lawrence in his report to King George VI, his great majesty King George VI, admitted this fact. So, here when Mr. Jinnah was making a concession, the Congress found it unacceptable. So, the unity of India was uh, of uh, so uh, little importance that uh, when the Muslim League made a concession and when the Congress professed to have accepted it, what happened is that uh, when it resulted, when the rejection by the Muslim League resulted in the partition program, when the 6th June, 6th December 1946 meetings in London resulted in upholding the Muslim League interpretation of the cabinet mission plan, then the Congress saw partition as the only alternative before them. At that time, according to Mahatma Gandhi, the cabinet mission plan should be imposed as an award. In 1946, he said it should not be imposed as an award. In 1947, with the partition looming in front of him, he said that it would be, should be approved by, and it should be implemented as an award, made binding. So the cabinet mission plan is imposed and partition is not acted upon. The reference is V.P. Menon, Vapal Panguni Menon, who used to do the reforms commissioner and uh, he has written a book called The Transfer of Power in India, published from Bombay Orient Longman and the page number is 371. Here he admits that Mahatma Gandhi has demanded that the cabinet mission plan be imposed as an award in 1947. So it's very, very misleading to, to say that the Congress found it unacceptable. And why did they accept it? You see, here this book. Look, in Peter Clark. Here he says that uh, I don't know, um, I hope that they have not uh, pull the acceptance of the Congress mission plan with so many cabbage or so many uh, reservations and so many qualifications that it really amounts to a rejection. This is something that Slip said in advance of seeing the text of the Congress acceptance of the cabinet mission plan. Here it is. So one can't, one can't dismiss uh, the cabinet mission plan as something that Congress rejected, did not reject, it professed not to have rejected. So this is a misleading simplification. Now let's come to 
Who was responsible for the partition? Of course, the Muslim League was responsible for the partition. But there are some people who blame it on uh, Congress. For example, this matter. They say that they had Congress accepted the cabinet mission plan, had on had Jawaharlal Nehru on becoming the Congress president on 10th July not uh, threatened to do away with all provisions of the cabinet plan or the safeguards of the cabinet mission plan, then partition would not have been taken place. So this is uh, what uh, people mean when they say that Congress and Jinnah, that it was Congress and not Jinnah who was actually responsible for the partition of India. They do not say that the Congress partitioned India, but what they say is that they took certain steps which left no option but for the Muslim League to go for partition and turn back on the cabinet mission plan. Now I ask you, here is his statement. Now Professor Ishtiaq Ahmed on page 5 of his book says, it is interesting to note that a journalistic version blaming the Congress for partition was propounded in the late 1960s and popularized in the late 1970s by Pakistani Maoists. Now let me ask you, this is something which has been said by Bolan Abul Kalam Azad. Was he a Pakistani Maoist? Was Shira Roy a Pakistani Maoist? Was S.K. Mujumdar? the author of Jinnah and Gandhi that wrote in the uh, history of India's freedom, Calcutta, 1966, was S.K. Majumdar a Pakistani Maoist? No. They, this is absolutely a red herring. It's not Maoist at all. When people study a historical event, they will look into the causes. They will look into the causes and they will see what has been the role of the other parties, what has been the role of the party. Lord Mountbatten reported that Liaquatri Khan, he reported to his staff that Liaquatri Khan went so far as to say it was fortunate that Congress had not accepted the cabinet mission plan when the Muslim League had accepted it. Otherwise, the Muslim League would have been trapped. In any case, I have given evidence everywhere elsewhere that Liyakati uh, Khan had given a written document to the Qaeda Yasin why the Muslim League should not accept the cabinet mission plan. His main uh, phase was that the cabinet mission plan which leaves the coercive powers of the state with the Congress, the army, the armed forces, the police, the militia, they will all be in Congress hands and they shall be used to nullify whatever state bars and guarantees the minorities have under the cabinet mission plan. In spite of that, Mr. Jinnah accepted the cabinet mission plan in good faith. But when on uh, 10th July, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru publicly said that he would not be bound by anything, there would be no grouping then the Muslim League was forced to go back, hold another session of the council and withdraw its acceptance of the Congress cabinet mission plan. So, 
what is what was the necessity of partition now when professor ishtiaq ahmed addresses what can be called the necessity of partition he writes on page 501 the 1928 motilal nehru report had clearly proposed equal citizen right for all men and women okay 501 yeah now this is confounding history what the congress proposed was not a guarantee and it has a history why it was not a guarantee is that in march 1927 Mr. Jina and other Muslim leaders, Muslim leaders also got together and put another set of constitutional proposals for the Delhi Muslim Proposal, 1927. Mrs. Sarojini Haider had a very high opinion of it. This is revealed in she had already spoken. Private correspondence was read out. She said that. and the congress accepted the delhi muslim proposal in may not only that in december madras session 1927 the congress ratified its acceptance of the delhi muslim proposal then the congress went back on an agreement it had accepted congress went back on an agreement it had even ratified and then produced the motilal nehru report in which all the safeguards given in the delhi muslim proposals were withdrawn it is uh, rather and kind to suggest that the muslims of india should have relied on the muslim on the motilal nehru report for their survival so that is also one premise of professor ishtia kehmal which is not accepted is controversy there is controversy not only among foreign authors but among pakistani authors about the purpose and the meaning of the 11th august 1947 speech that mohammad ali jinnah had made in which he said that you may go to your boss you may go to your temples you may go to your churches that has nothing to do is the business of the state we are starting with this principle that all of us are citizens and equal citizens of the state now naturally as he said that uh, since the minorities in pakistan would have full religious freedom it would have full freedom so on account of that there are people who who not want minorities to have religious freedom the liberals they stress this aspect and others like professor ishtia kamal say that no this was just a passing thing to show uh, foreign delegates and then uh, here he says on face there as for his third position the one and only exa- example of a secular state can be found in his speech of 11th august 1947 which i shall demonstrate i emphasize what he writes which i shall in the mistake was relegated relegated to insignificance by him and his close associate as soon as he had delivered 
what she means to say is that what Jinnah said on 11th August was meant to impress foreign delegates and nothing more. We forget that foreign delegates were invited on 14th August, not on the 11th August. And on 14th August, when Lord Mountbatten in his speech had expressed the hope that Jena, the Muslim League, the Pakistan cabinet will fall the precepts of Akbar, the great Mughal, in uh, tolerating other priests. Uh, Jena had said that uh, it's not the seed of Akbar, it is the Islamic League, it is the example of the Prophet himself who treated non Muslims with kindness and consideration. So, when the foreign delegates were there on 14th of August, he stressed the Islamic element. That is very so to say that he did not uh, really subscribe to what he was saying on 11th of August is not correct. And I will quote you another piece of Mr. Jinnah. Small piece. You see, when the partition spread, you know, uh, I think from uh, Professor Ishtiyakayama's earlier book on the partition of the Punjab, that trains were being cut, I mean say, the passengers on the trains travelling from India to Pakistan and Pakistan to India were being cut down. In 1947, air travel was very restricted to the privileged, so it was no means of mass movement. That left only three passengers. So a lot of Hindus and Sikhs gathered in Karachi, hoping to escape from Pakistan through the sea route going from Calcutta to Bombay and from Bombay, if they did not belong to Bombay, to other respective places in India. The Muslims who had concentrated, the Muslims from the minority provinces who had concentrated in Karachi because it was a new chapter, a segment of them set upon these Hindu and Sikh refugees. This infuriated Mr. Jinnah. He went to the radio and he made a very strong speech condemning atrocities against the Hindus in the Sikh and one small excerpt I read out to you. Redressing the Muslim refugee, he said, they should not abuse the hospitality that has been extended to us. Mr. Jinnah telling them the truth. Muslim refugees should not abuse the hospitality that has been extended to them. I once more want to impress upon all Muslims that they should fully cooperate with the government and the officials in protecting their Hindu neighbors. Jinnah speaking in his statement 1947 to 1948, October 2000, page 92. Yes, the page is there. So, here we are. What are the failures of Jena? The failure of Jena is that he was able to prevent the partition of the problem. He was able to, unable to prevent the unfairness of the rightless award. Now, Professor Ishtiyak Emma says that uh, he had been warned beforehand that he would get neither Gujarat food and uh, he would uh, get neither Gujarat food nor Kafka. You know, so, because he has been forewarned, it's not an unfair That is not true. It is true, as I have said, that in the brief that the cabinet delegation has prepared for uh, their talks with dinner. 
it was supposed to offer Mr. Jinnah Punjab without Gujarat food. But there is no knowing whether this was actually conveyed to him or not. Because this has existed. Here I think I have a um, emergence of Pakistan that was the Bahamas Ali. He was uh, one of the actors in the scene. So he can be relied upon. What takes place is that uh, on the 4th of June, that is one day after the 3rd June plan was announced, Lord Mountbatten, the voice boy, he makes a speech saying that the Muslim majority of uh, Gurdaspur is so slim is that uh, it is not certain that Gurdaspur will go to Pakistan. Why Sunday is out? He could have simply said that Mr. Jina has been told that Gurdaspur will not be awarded to Pakistan. There's another story I'll tell you that you find it in my book that V.P. Damon Krishna and even Pandit Nehru had been corresponding with the British authorities in 1946 for Gurdaspur not to be given to Pakistan. Krishna Menon has said that if if Pakistan was strengthened with the accession of Kashmir, it would be a blow to, it would be a setback to Anglo-Indian relations. They had asked Lord Mountbatten to destroy the letter, but mercifully Lord Mountbatten preserved it. It was discovered from the broadband archive, archive and that is how we learned. Now in the course of an interview on social media in connection with this book of his, uh, Professor Ishtiaq Ahmad said that the basic premise of the book was that the British did not want a unified India to emerge and it was for that reason that it primed the Muslim League and Jinnah to call for Pakistan and they created Pakistan Pakistan was a result of a British conspiracy to weaken India. Now, what is the basis of this, ex, this, uh, this uh, allegation? I don't understand. Because what I have seen is quite the contrary. What I have seen is that the British did their level best, at least ever since Clement Attlee came in. The Labour Party came in. See the Viceroy's journal, label the Viceroy. You will find that they were trying to propitiate Congress disregarding the rights of the minorities, the rights of the Muslim League. And I will give you instances, I'll quote you instances. What did the cabinet delegation say regarding partition in their statement? It was a statement made by the cabinet delegation along with the Viceroy, Lord Wavell. Now here I read out paragraph 7. We have been therefore forced to the conclusion, we have been therefore forced to the conclusion that neither a larger nor a smaller sovereign state would provide an acceptable solution for the communal problem. Here, both the three members of the cabinet delegation sent by Attlee and the Viceroy jointly say in this paragraph that they do not want to consider a small or large sovereign state, which means of course Pakistan. 
in paragraph 11 of the same statement they say we are unable we are therefore unable to advise the british government that the power which at present resides in british hands should be handed over to two entirely separate sovereign states now for the first you see wavell the viceroy's journal page 473 for the seven second statement it is wavell viceroy's journal page 74 the next page of course 11 seven and 11 now what did lord mountbatten say to mr jana about it about the unity of india now i can't give you a long quotation you'll find it here in the freedom of midnight come on let me read it out to you it's a long quote so i have to read it out with the all the eloquence he he, he could command this is Lord Mountbatten, he is Lord Mountbatten. With all the eloquence he could command, he painted a picture of the greatness India could achieve. Four hundred million people of different races and creeds, bound together by a central union government, with all the economic strength that would accrue to them from increased industrialization, playing a great part in world affairs as the most progressive single entity in the far east surely mr jinnah did not want to destroy all that to condemn the subcontinent to the existence of a third rate power this shows that the british had wanted a large united india they had not wanted a divided india there was a strong opposition that by the war time prime minister sir vincent church had been prevented them from completely disregarding the muslim league they considered a partition yes but they considered a partition which was unfair so there was no british conspiracy quite the contrary it was their desire to preserve the unity of this spelt out by lord mountbatten to jinnah and here is a man who started as a congress politician you forced him to make a choice between communal survival and territorial integrity why did you bring him up to this point you see partition in terms is was necessary for human rights he, he, in this book he brings up liaquat khan he brings up uh, zulfiqar ali bhutto he brings up ziaul haq what did they have to do with what mr jena wanted his role in history maybe but then you have to see that uh, he secured pakistan a truncated pakistan a moth eaten pakistan as even lord mountbatten had conceded talking to jinnah but it is at least a state i think i recall this in an interview i made last time we have a uh, an imperfect solution to the communal problem true but at that moment in history with all the meager resources we had with all the meager resources we had we achieved a state which up till 1965 was upheld as a model of economic development mm. 
then I make a comparison with Israel. What is the population of Israel? Is it a majority in the Arab world? It's a minority. It expanded its borders in 1948. In 1956, in 1967, and in 1973. Now, a number of Arab states, including Egypt and the UAE and Libya, have recognized Israel. That is because they have state power. We have state power. We have relatively eaten grass, but we are a nuclear power. Yesterday, the Secretary of the United Nations said that both Pakistan and India are nuclear powers and any conflict between them would be disastrous not only for both the nations but for the whole world. Why did he say for the whole world? Because any nuclear conflagration between these two neighboring states would result in blocking out the sunshine for 300 years. It would mean the end of mankind. So it's not the Pakistan of 1971. It's not the Pakistan of 50 years old. We have progressed. Our voice is heard. Our voice is heard in the European Union Parliament in the United Nations and even in the House of Representatives and the Senate of the United States by even I must express my admiration for them by the legislators who are of Indian origin. This was his success. But no man could achieve more with a partial 